moment. It's a pleasure to be here for the second time. Uh, and I'm very thankful to Hans and Gutin for taking me all the way to Bodrum once again. And it's a pleasure to join the uh, symposium. Uh, today I will speak, I'm from Turkey. My name is Mustafa Akil. I'm a writer. Uh, I write opinion columns for two different Turkish newspapers. And in my columns, I make often political commentaries. And once in a while, I criticize what we call Kemalism in Turkey which is the constitutionally established official ideology. Uh, like, I mean, we just heard that all states are like mafia and all criminals, but you know, I think some states are still slightly better, some still states are slightly uh, worse. And I think it's a bigger problem when you have an official ideology in the country. Because when it's established in the constitution as the official ideology that all citizens should subscribe to, then the people who don't subscribe to the ideology can feel uh, suppressed, as I think we often see in the case with Turkey. So uh, that's why I will just give you a little brief of Kemalism to uh, explain the dichotomy in Turkey between Kemalism and uh, freedom, uh, freedom of the citizens. And the French, the, the title was uh, suggested by Hans, the French connection, it made, it made a lot of sense to me because yes, there is a lot of interesting connection between Kemalism and its roots in Europe, and especially the French Jacobin revolutionary tradition. And when we see this in the very life of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of Turkey and the uh, founder of Kemalism, well, some people say it was interpreted after him, which is somewhat true, but the core figure of Kemalism is definitely Mustafa Kemal himself. And at the time, the late Ottoman times, when he was an Ottoman general, when the empire fell in 1918 in, in World War I, he arose as the war hero and then he reestablished Turkey as a modern republic in 1923. Probably you all know that history. Uh, what that history also is very much you know, emphasized in Turkish textbooks, but what is not often said is that at the end of the Ottoman Empire, there were different schools of thought among Ottoman intellectuals. There was a liberal tradition for sure, especially spearheaded by Prince Sabahattin. He was called a prince because he was a nephew of Sultan Abdul Hamid. And he emphasized two concepts, decentralization and individual entrepreneurship. So he was basically believing in a limited state and the state should just open the way for entrepreneurship and you know, management of the country should be decentralized. That was his idea. Uh, but that was not a very popular idea for other people. And there was another group of people, and especially among the young Turks. They said the state should guide the society. The state should understand what is truth and uh, teach the society, educate the society, transform the society according to an ideal. And they especially got that ideal mainly from the French Revolution and the French Enlightenment, which uh, lies under the French Revolution. So just want to give you a start with one quote from a historian, Dr. Turkoyato, who is himself a Kemalist. Uh, and in, in his article on the principles of Kemalism, he says, while a young man in Macedonia, Mustafa Kemal was introduced to the French classics, especially the works of Rousseau, Voltaire, and Montesquieu, through his close friend, Feti Okiar. While a young cadet in the war academy, he studied the French Revolution thoroughly. Later, he made frequent references to episodes in this great event of history. According to him, it was the greatest of all revolutions. The idea, which really Mustafa Kemal liked in the French Revolution, was this idea that there should be a cadre which gets the enlightenment and understands the problem with obscurantism and religious traditions, and especially uh, carries this war against the, the clerics, the religious establishment, and then imposes this truth on society. Uh, no wonder he, he and his people in the 19, late 1920s and 30s, the Kemalists, use a very interesting uh, like a motto. In, in the United States, I'm sure you're all familiar with the motto, a government uh, for the people, by the, a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. The Turkish Republic, the Kemalist Republic, was defined as a government for the people, in spite of the people. <laughs> and, and this was also expressed through arts. 
And I want to show you like a interesting painting from 1933. This is a painting about the Turkish Revolution by Zeki Faik Izar, who was like a state-sponsored artist. And Ikhlaf Yolunda means on the path to revolution. And as you can see, this is like Ataturk in the middle and pointing his finger to the, you know, to the wisdom ahead that the nation should go. And the people who are in front of the revolution and who are obviously killed here are an, is an Ottoman Pasha who is on the floor and two men with beards and turbans, they're the clerics, and so they are just cracked down and they're just beaten by the revolution, and the nation is marching on. Of course, this, is, this gets an inspiration from a more famous painting by Will Lacroix of the French Revolution. Uh, well, you just cannot see the side of the picture because of the I think, slide, but no problem. Well, this lady is a little more modest in terms of her you know, dress code. But still, the idea is the same, and the expression is the same, basically. Um, so this, uh, this was just you know, the, the, what they believed in. But b despite this French influence, the idea of revolution and Jacobinism, and it's an also interesting thing that I should say that today, the term Jacobinism is a household in, term in Turkey. We often refer to the Kemalists as the Jacobins. Sometimes it is not legally good to say them, call them Kemalists and criticize them because there's a law protecting Ataturk. And if you say some you know, critical things about the Kemalist era, you might you know, get sued for it and even end up in jail. So Jacobinism is sometimes a euphemism for, uh, Tur uh, in Turkey for Kemalism, but we often only call it Jacobins because the bas basic idea that you should create a republic despite some of the, uh, the sections in society and then you know march through this uh, goal that you have in mind is basically the same idea. So this idea, this ideology was formulated in the 1930s, uh, in the late 1930s by Ataturk and his followers. And as you can see here, Ataturk speaking in the Turkish parliament in the late 30s. And there are six arrows behind him. These six arrows are the six arrows of the Kemalist ideology. And they have, we can list them here. One is nationalism, which is a big issue. Because the Ottoman Empire, uh, as also Peter will explain it to us, I think, in a much better way, was a multi-ethnic, multicultural, no, multiple cultures is not a very maybe good term here, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. There was not one identity. It was not a Turkish empire. Turks were definitely dominant, but there were Kurds, Arabs, there were Armenians, Jews, Greeks, all were children of the empire. Uh, with the republic, nationalism and Turkish nationalism became the uh, core belief, and non-Turks had to be converted into Turkishness over time, and especially Kurds were you know, uh, introduced into Turkishness, which they didn't like that much, so that's why Turkey still has a problem with its Kurdish citizens. Was, nationalism was one idea. The secularism idea was the second one, the second arrow. This was actually very important for the French, laïcité. It became laïclic in Turkey. And it is very much like the secularism of the Third Republic in, French, uh, in France, which, is, which was very hostile to traditional religious establishment, very anti-clerical. So that basically the same idea is there. And unlike the you know, idea of separation of church and state in the US, which is both protecting religion which is about protecting the state from religion, but also protecting religion from the state. In Turkey, it's not about, no, there's nothing about protecting religion from the state. It's just about state uh, just being totally devoid of religious influ influence and state secularizing the society. That's a core idea uh, in Turkish uh, secularism. The Turkish Constitutional Court, for example, defines uh, secularism and it says, you know, it, says, it means that the state should not be based on religion and it says, the state should protect the society from beliefs and judgments that are not based on science and reason. So state will look, state will say this idea is not based on science and reason, so I'm protecting the society from this idea. Which explains you why you know, civil religion, you know, religion which is independent of the state, has always cracked, been cracked down uh, by the Kemalist establishment in Turkey. And, and the, uh, the, the, the limitations of this practice goes on in things like the Escar plan on the, on the public square. There's another idea called statism, 
Uh, this basically meant that the state should run the economy. Uh, and Kemalists especially implemented this by getting some inspiration from corporatism of Mussolini in the 1930s uh, and the corporatist model is explained by scholar Taha Parlo was extensively impl uh, implemented in, in the Turkish scene. There are three other principles, peopleism, revolutionism, republicanism. These are just actually, I think, just to add more arrows. I mean, they don't mean too much. The first three ones are really the important ones. So nationalism, secularism, and statism. And today, the, the conflicts in Turkish society often come to one of these arrows. Because of the statism arrow, for example, the Turkish constitutional court several times uh, annulled the privatization decisions of the governments, elected governments, because they said Atatürk opened this uh, factory as a state factory. It's based on statism principle, and you cannot privatize it. So the Constitutional Court basically prevent, uh, prevents governments you know, from overriding these principles. And when there was recently a big fight in Turkey, or like a big you know, uh, struggle in Turkey about secularism, Again, the Constitutional Court took an interesting decision. And let me tell you a brief history about that. Uh, as you know, in France, too, headscarf is banned in some places, I mean, in high schools. Uh, and people look at that and people say, well, Turkey is getting the French idea. But in Turkey, it's much more severe. The headscarf is banned in not just public, but also private schools. And not just in public, but also private universities as well. So literally, in universities, there's a police waiting there. And if someone comes with a headscarf, police says, stop, take it off, then you can get in. Some girls wear wigs on the headscarf to get in, some take it off, but this is like a constant you know, uh, clash uh, between the society. And by saying this, let me note this, I mean, in some countries, some Muslim women are forced to wear the headscarf. And that's, I think, a fundamental violation of liberty but in Turkey, it's the opposite. I mean, they're forced to take it off. So that's another, I think, violation of liberty. Recently, the Turkish parliament, and it, by the leading uh, justice in the open party, took a decision to set the headscarf free in the universities. Just in the universities. And they, uh, this leading party, justice and the open party, and two other parties in the parliament, voted for a constitutional amendment, which put, up, put a little clause in the Constitution, which basically said everybody is entitled to high, a higher education regardless of their dress code. So that little clause in the Constitution would allow a girl to wear a scarf and you know, get, get into campus. And 411 of 550 seats in the parliament, members in the parliament, voted yes for this. So it was like, a great majority of the parliament passed this constitution and accepted it. Then Turkey's constitutional court looked at this and they said, uh, this is against secularism, you can do this. And they said, and in the first three articles of the Turkish Const constitution, the Turkish constitution is interesting, there are first three articles which says Turkey is this, Turkey is that. It mentions Atatürk's nationalism as core foundations of the Turkish Republic. Then in the fourth article it says, these three articles cannot be changed. Either they are changing, cannot be proposed. It's totally this undiscussable, these first three articles. And the Constitutional Court said, since secularism is in the first three articles, and you are adding somewhere in the Constitution, which, to our perspective, con confronts secularism, we are not allowing this you know, constitutional amendment. So the Constitutional Court blocked the uh, amendment. But that was not the only thing, what happened? Then the Council of State, the top prosecutor of the Council of State, opened a closure case against the ruling party, saying that this party is anti-secular and it should be closed down, and the prime minister and 70 members of the parliament should be banned from politics. The case went on for six months, and finally the Constitutional Court decided that the party is guilty, but they said they will not close it down, they will give them a big, you know, financial, you know, like a fee. So they, they, they have been deprived from budget assistance, which everybody gets in Turkey. So that was the kind of decision, and the Constitutional Court basically said that, I mean, if you ever touch anything about, uh, you know, the secularism principle, uh, you know, I think your party will end. 
Uh, of course, I mean, it's a tradition in t uh, Turkey to close down political parties. Up to now, almost 25 political parties have been closed down by the Constitutional Court. Um, because the con th these parties violate the uh, law about political parties. What does the law say? Law says, well, law says all political parties must be based on Ataturk's principles. So, I mean, that's in the law. So, if you found a political party, and if you say, and you don't have to say I'm disagreeing with secularism. I mean, AKP doesn't say they disagree with secularism. They just say we believe in a different interpretation of secularism. They say in our understanding of secularism, there is no harm in a college student wearing a headscarf and taking classes in sociology or whatever. And I think that's a you know very reasonable point of view. But according to the constitutional court, there are two principles in the constitution and in the political parties law. They interpret what it means, and then. Uh, that you know brings this, uh, and anybody who goes against that can be closed down uh, by the, the constitutional court. The parties who have been closed down by the constitutional court are either generally parties who challenge the official definition of secularism, or the parties who challenge the official definition of the first era, nationalism. Uh, and nationalism is also interesting. There is an interesting article in the Jewish Constitution. Again, it says, very short article. It says. Anybody who is a citizen of Turkey is a Turk. Now, that doesn't sound too bad in the beginning, but then you say, well, not everybody in this country defines themselves as Turks. I mean, they're, they're Kurdish citizens, and they say, well, we are Kurds. Well, they are proud, they can be proud of being the citizens of the Turkish Republic, but this doesn't mean they're Turks, because Turkishness is also an ethnic identity. Well, the state will tell you Turkish citizenship is not an ethnic identity. It means just the citizenship of Turkey. But then, when you go into the education system, what is taught is the history of the ethnic Turks from Central Asia to today. Then there are Turks in Cyprus. We call them you know, Turks. Or I mean, they're not our citizens, definitely. But we call them Cypriot Turks. We call them Bulgarian Turks. So definitely, Turkishness is something which is which can be separate from the being being a citizen of Turkey. But apparently. Everybody who's a citizen of Turkey has to accept themselves as Kurds. So several Kurdish parties have said, well, we don't want this definition. We want a different, you know, we want our Kurdishness you know, to be expressed. The thing is, Turkey has become much more liberal now. 20 years ago, to saying I am a Kurd would be a crime. And in 1982, a politician uh, during the military coup, because the military coups are the times when these six principles are really pressed hard. You know? I mean, that's the that's like the Stalin era. <laughs> then you have like a Khrushchev era and you have like softer versions. But during a, a politician, Sharaf Etinechi in 1982, went to jail for simply saying, I'm a Kurd and there are Kurds in Turkey. We are now in a much more better situation. Now there's a Kurdish channel, uh, TV channel opened by the state. Kurdish education is being discussed. Broadcast is free. But that has been thanks to battle with this, you know, uh, basically state ideology. and the, and the supporters of the state ideology often, you know, put obstacles to these reforms. The reforms are now being supported, like sponsored by the EU. And again, there's a contradiction between the state ideology and the, and the reforms towards a more liberal open society. Uh, as you can even may, maybe know, one of the you know important uh, figures in Turkey in the liberal movement or libertarian, I would say, movement. Attila Yayla, Professor Atilla, who was here last year, he was like uh, sentenced for three years in prison for insulting Ataturk in a speech. And he simply said Ataturk's period was a period of not progress, but regression in terms of civil liberties. And he said, why do we have the statues of this man everywhere? Simply because he said this man, instead of you know, our supreme leader, and uh, that he said it was a time of regression may put him into jail. So I'm not saying those things. He said that. So if you hear from me, <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> the thing is, the, all these come from this radical enlightenment idea that you know you should create a modern nation by fighting the internal enemies, and it's all known. And I think French Revolution is one example. But in Turkey, there are other elements which has gone beyond. You know, French Revolution, and I think it represents, it sometimes resembles Maoism, uh, to, be, to be honest, because of the Cultural Revolution aspect, and also because of the cult of personality. 
The French Revolution was like a, a cadre of people, like Robespierre, you know, Danton, several people who were out there. And although they created a goddess of reason, none of the leaders of the revolution became a god in himself. But in Turkey, that's exactly what you have. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk himself has been turned into a demigod. And you can see this if you go around Turkey. You can see his statues everywhere. His quotes are on every wall. And every official wall is like with his picture. And the thing is, it is interesting. Like in, in the 1930s, there were poems. And you know, like there were poets who wrote poems like, uh, there's one interesting line. He, one poet said, "Let the Kaaba, you know, the Arabic, you know, Islamic, uh, holy site, be for the Arabs. What we have is Chankaya now, and Chankaya was at the uh, residence. So it was there. Are, even the, in, in literature, there were like things defining him as this new god shining on Turkey. And I'll just want to share that you know cult of personality element with you a little bit. It's some pictures and." Photographs. Okay, here's a, here's a, these are kind of images you always see in Turkish textbooks and on the internet. I got these from the internet, but they are all over, like in, in all the official buildings and publications. Here's the face of Atatürk, not a very handsome man, unfortunately. He was a handsome man, actually. The, the one in the middle, and that's the map of Turkey, and it says Turkish. The Turkish Republic will live forever, his word and his Atatürk there, and like his face is gleaming over Turkey. I mean, this is a very common you know, depiction of Turkey and Atatürk as like two equal, like the, he means the country, and the whole country is like for him. He's depicted here as like in the skies, you know, like shine, looking over his nation, and the sea is with the Turkish flag, and he's about the sun and looking and glooming over you know, his nation. Again, you can see, here is him shining like a star again on Turkey. You can see the same thing in my mom's posture, but I didn't have them here. Anyway. So, one other more thing. Again here, Atatürk is here. This is, every year, there are several national like festivals in Turkey. Five national festivals. And one is the, the day Atatürk gave to, the chil gave to children. The other one is the day Atatürk gave to uh, the youth. The other day is when Atatürk had a victory over the Greeks. The other day is when he announced a republic. And the fifth important day is the day when he died. At that time, like 9.05, sirens go out and every citizen is, uh, stands like this and remembers the death of the you know, leader. And in, this, in pictures like this, he's always, like this is from one of the national festivals of At the day for the remembrance of Atatürk. Like this is a special, special you know, festival for the remembrance of Atatürk. And posters like this are everywhere. In all these posters, there are other ones like here. He's always looking to some distant future and some vision. And all the people are running and you know, cheering under his like. Here are, it's like some man and here are some soldiers and there are other like, like Turkish people happy under his like, guidance. And that's the common image you know, used in Turkish uh, popular uh, mythology. Here is like a, you know, his statues are in every school, and in every school, Turkish students are supposed to take an oath of allegiance to, to the pers persona of Atatürk every uh, week. I did that, like, like every Turkish student. And the uh, oath of allegiance has interesting lines. It says in one place, O oh, the Atatürk, who has given us this day, we will relentlessly walk on your path. And, you know, we will never falter, and we will always follow our guidance. And at the end, you, you're supposed to say, my, let my existence be a gift to the Turkish existence. So it's like kind of you're sacrificing yourself for the nation and for Atatürk, whose vision is, you know, unquestionable and, uh, like, definitely all-knowing and you know, all -knowing and wise. So here is, like, a... Children are brought to Atatürk's tomb every, like, every, like... In all of these occasions, national feasts, and you know, they have their his pictures on his chest, and you know, they have his, like a posters, and they walk around him and march him, and you know, sing for uh, his glory. Here's another picture, very funny. Students like have masks of Atatürk, so they are all little replicas of the eternal leader. This is like one of the celebrations in the Children's Day. Now, one final interesting thing is Atatürk is everywhere, and you know there are actually little poems that children say like he's seeing us everywhere, like he's all around, like in the wall he's looking at us. I mean that idea is out there. 
But he even has some natural miracles. I mean, miracles in nature. And that just came up a few years ago. And I think this is, I think, one of the things. Oh, sorry. This is before that. I'll go to miracle in a minute. This is before the miracle. This is Nemutu Türküm Diyanet in Turkish, which means how happy is the one who says I am a Turk. That is Atatürk's most famous motto. And you know, you learn this, you memorize it everywhere. It is written on mountains. And especially it is written on mountains in the southeast where the Kurds live. Because Kurds are not Turkish. And, but they are supposed to be happy by saying how happy I am a Turk. I went to Diyarbakir once, uh, well, several times, but one, one of them I saw this interesting scene. Diyarbakir is the biggest uh, city in Turkey with a predominantly Kurdish population. And in the middle of the city, there's a military garrison. And this motto is, again, written on the wall of the garrison. How happy is the one who says, I'm a Turk? But the wall is protected by meters of barbed wire <laughs> from the Kurds who are not happy to say that they are Turkish. <laughs> and you know, that's where it goes on there. Okay, and the final miracle. This is very interesting. You know, mountains has his you know signs and his faces. That's all done by the state. We know that. But what if there is a miracle and if a natural sign of what the truth comes up? This came up a few years ago in this mountain. This is a region called Damal in eastern Turkey, and the shade of the mountain is interestingly like his Atatürk silhouette. You know, there's his nose here, his nose and you know. His and like, his hair out there. So when somebody noticed that, it became a big news, and it became the Atatürk miracle, and everybody you know, published about this, the press was going there. And the Turkish military started to organize tours there and celebrations there to remember Atatürk on the eve the, of this mountain. So people go there, they take photos, and you know, picture themselves behind Atatürk. Like, again, military. There's this generals here and go there and they just salute at the troop on the mountain and you know feel happy for the miracle. Even little kids go there and you know they are like saluting each other and taking pose in the like uh, on the behind the you know silhouette of the supreme leader. So the thing is, what this shows is this. Let me say one thing. Atatürk was definitely a great personality and he brought many good things to Turkey. Like female rights, and I think he has a great place in Turkish history. Uh, but he was like one of the you know, important figures in Turkey. There are other important people in Turkey. And the thing is, he had some made mistakes. And you know, he, he did very important mistakes. He backed off from some of them. Some of them just kept on. And the thing is, some of the things he did for, uh, for his time was maybe justified according to those norms. But we are living in a different age right now. The problem is, by destroying all the traditional values by just creating a zero for a society, ground zero, and just creating a whole new mythology. Just Kemalism created a cult, and this cult creates what they hate most. And the Kemalists hate the term dogma. For them, dogma means religion. And they say, we are going to create a dogma-free society. Well, they have created a dogma-dominated society by things like that. It, the, the ideology itself became a dogma. And in Turkey today, you cannot do and justify anything without saying, oh, if Atatürk was here today, he would think like me. But the other people say, no, no, if Atatürk was here today, he would vote for our party. So he became this su superhuman you know, uh, framework reference, which is blocking uh, like liberalism in Turkey, democratization in Turkey, which is which is justifying military coup, which is justifying all sorts of state suppression on the citizens. So I think the lesson from that should be that all humans are human and no leader should be deified. And people should be seen in their historical context. Azrup was a man who was inspired by French Revolution, German, vulgar materialismus, this was another source he was reading. He believed in scientism, the idea that science would replace religion and would show us all the truth. But we know it doesn't work right now today. But un unfortunately, many Turks don't know because they still believe that the supreme leader, as he's officially called in Turkey, told us all the truth we need and we don't need more any truth. Thank you.